Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. And would like to thank the organization for inviting me, for having me here to talk about the ABC of early rehab in the ICU. And uh, I've no com conflicts of interest uh, related to, to this uh, topic. And I will talk in short about uh, illness burning and uh, the consequence of ICU admission, uh, early rehab uh, interventions, and the ABC uh, bundle. And bringing back Luke into this presentation, um, we can expect that he is seriously, uh, seriously ill when he is admitted in the ICU, like normal patients are in the ICU, and his highest illness burden will be in the ICU. During and after the ICU, the, the illness burden will decrease. And like most other patients in the ICU, also Luke will be on the mechanical ventilator, uh, and he will probably be sedated like most patients. Now most, I would say, one-third to 50% of our patients will suffer from delirium during the ICU. Uh, most patients are agitated, and, and, and for that reason also, patients suffer from pain. And he has a good chance that he will be physically restrained. Around 20 to 55% uh, of the patients in the ICU, all in Europe, it's, but it's also in the Netherlands, it's similar. Around 20 to 25% are physically restrained, so that will be probably a good chance that Luke will be physically restrained. He will suffer from sleeping problems and he will be immobilized. But there's also good news for him, but because he has a good chance to survive the ICU. So up to today, it's around over 50 or 85 percent of the patients will survive the ICU nowadays. And this is due to advances in critical care medicine, as well as uh, due to the medical technology. But ICU admission is also devastating for the patient. And that's re that result in long-lasting uh, problems for the patient that, that really impacts patients' life. And this is so-called the post-intensive care syndrome. And this is defined as new or worsening impairment in physical, cognitive, or mental health status arising and persisting after hospitalization for critical illness. So that's the definition of PICS, post-intensive care syndrome. And around 85,000 patients are annually admitted in the ICU in the Netherlands, so around 75,000 patients will survive the ICU. And a good chance also for Luke that he will suffer from post-intensive care syndrome, syndrome afterwards, so around 50 to 70 percent. So illness burning is not only in the ICU and not after discharged from the hospital for a long time afterwards as well. And that's really impacting the patient's uh, quality of life, uh, but also for his family life. What we know from PICS is mostly done from other studies in other countries, but for the Dutch situation, it's not, uh, mostly it's unknown how it is in the ICU in the Netherlands. So for that reason, we started with the monitor I see, and in, that's a multi standard study in which all patients that are admitted to the ICU in four, five uh, centers uh, around Nijmegen uh, are included in the monitor I see, and we will follow them for, over for five years and rate their quality of life at baseline, so how it was before ICU admission, and follow it after three months, 12 months, till five years afterwards. And also, it's not only about quality of life, but it's also about fatigue, uh, post drastic stress uh, syndrome, uh, as well as new symptoms like PICS uh, that maybe occur. And at that time, we have included around 3,000 patients in this monitor I see. And we recently uh, analyzed the first one year's data of 900 patients. And I was somewhat surprised, so hopefully, it, no, it's not, still not working. But around 70% of the patients have still, after one year, have problems with reduced condition, with reduced condition afterwards. So that's how it was before and how it was one year after ICU admission. 
around 40% still suffering from, or have suffered from stiffness in joints, muscle weakness, short of breath. So it's a huge amount of problems that patients facing after one year, still facing after one year after the ICU discharge. And this really impacts their quality of life. So this is the short form 36, consisting of eight domains, physical functioning, role functioning, uh, role physical, uh, vitality, mental health, and so on. And 35% have a decline in, fun functional, in, in physical functioning. That's one year after the ICU admission. So 40% have decline in fatality and 40% have decline in general health. So that's a huge amount of problems and that's also affecting their quality of life. So ICU survivors have multiple uh, long-term problems and that need to be tackled, I think, in the early stage. So we need to start at the time of ICU admission. And we can start with early mobilization or we can start with less sedation or something else. So what about early mobilization? I think you all know this landmark study of Zweigert, published in 2009 in The Lancet. It's not a, a, a huge one, but uh, they included in the randomized control trial 100 patients with early mobilization, so early exercise compared with normal, usual care. And interestingly, more patients returned to their independent functional status after hospital uh, discharge were quicker uh, removed from the mechanical ventilator. And also there was the duration of de delirium was reduced. So that's really important. So that's about early mobilization. But if you will increase the exercise by early endurance and resistance training and compare that with uh, early mobilization program, and this is, published, this is a study that's recently published in, uh, in November two, 2018, and it's also a randomized control trial, and they didn't find any difference between early mobilization, so the normal care, early mobilization, and the early endurance. So no differences were found in that for the six minutes walking distance, and also not for the functional independent state and also not on the long-term physical uh, health for the patients. But, and that is really interesting, it improved the mental health score. The early mobilization is also included now in the, uh, uh, in the guideline of the Society of Critical Care Medicine that was published uh, uh, last year. The PEDAS guidelines, so the pain, agitation, delirium, immobility, and uh, sleep disorder guideline and they recommend to perform rehabilitation, early rehabilitation, and mobilization in the ICU. But the evidence for this is weak, but it is, there is something in. So what about sedation? And probably you also know this study from CRASH and published in the New England in 2000, where they used the, the daily interruption, so the daily awakening trial compared with the usual care, and to stop on a daily basis the uh, sedation that reduced the duration of mechanical ventilation and also patients were quicker from the ICU. So that's really important for the patient as well for early rehab. And what about if you don't use any sedation compared with some sedation with daily interruption, that's the STRUM. Uh, trial that was published in 2010. In the Lancet trial, you probably also know this. This is also a landmark study. And when you are not using any sedation compared with the daily interruption, uh, this also reduced the duration of mechanical ventilation, uh, also for length of stay in, and the length of stay in the ICU and length of stay in hospital. Uh, but there were more patients that... Uh, developed delirium and were treated more with uh, haloperidol. On the long term, they didn't find any difference on uh, mental and physical uh, outcome, but keep in mind, it was only in 26 patients, so that's not a huge group of patients. Building up on that was the ABC trial from Timothy Girard and Chris, um, where they compared the daily awakening trial and the daily uh, 
breathing trial compared with the usual care and the breathing trial. And when you use the daily awakening trial compared with the, and, and the uh, daily uh, breathing trial, that reduced the duration of uh, mechanical ventilation again, shorter duration in the ICU, less coma, more self-extubations in the daily awakening group, but no more re-intubation in that group. That's similar. So probably the patient knows better for us when he could be extubated. But when we have multiple problems, that also, I think, requires a multi-approach. So the ABC was extended to the A to F bundle, the ABCDE Late, uh, the latest one is the F uh, bundle. So the awakening trial, the breathing trial, the choice of sedation, analgesics also, delirium management, early mobilization, and family engagement. That's the last one, the F that's. If you're using the ABC, that will reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation as well as that patients will quicker discharge from the ICU and hospital. If you combine that with the D, so the delirium management, it also reduced delirium. And if you combine that with the early mobilization, so with the E, it also extra will reduce delirium, but also it will prevent the ICU acquired weakness. So, Awakening trial, breathing trial, that's what I said already. Uh, the choice of sedation and analgesics, preferably did they advise to use the alpha-2 agonists like uh, clonidine or dexmedidomidine, but at least you have to reduce the benzodiazepines. We know that that will harm the patients for delirium, for instance, but also will extend the duration of mechanical ventilation. For analgesics, you can use the fentanyl, ramifentanyl, or morphine, and maybe a low dose of ketamine to, uh, as an adjunct on the opioid therapy. And that's also within the uh, PADIS guideline. It's the same recommendation. And just recently, the ABC just changed slightly, so the A is not, again, awakening, but assessing and treating pain. The B is both awakening and breathing. That's... It's not, not that different, but they just change it a little bit. So then you have the delirium management, and it's the advice to assess all patients with a validated uh, delirium assessment tool like the ICAMSU or the ICDSC. Those are the two recommended and validated for ICU patients. Use a delirium prevention program, and we now know it's not that we are going to use any antipsychotics for, to reduce the... Um, or to prevent ICU delirium, so we know that already. So it's more like non-pharmacological interventions that can be used, and it's similar as for treatment. It's best to use uh, to treat patients with symptomatic uh, delirium, so the hyperactive and the mixed delirium subtypes, but also patients that suffer from hallucinations and delusions. That's the patient that you needed to treat. Early mobilization. So you can do the bed cycling, uh, keep um, uh, walk, the, walk with the patient, so keep them out of the bed. And what we do in, in Nijmegen is to, it's to go to swim with the patient. So that's really um, uh, impressive how it works and how it will return more like the autonomy for the patient. So he's getting in touch with, with the ground and he's going to move again, and that's really, that really improves his mental state, I think. So, and the last one is family engagement, that's the F. Um, and I think the role of the family, the relatives, is really important. So, um, it, so we can involve the family, the relatives, in, in the daily care, but also maybe for food massage that can be used by, by the family to give them a role in daily care. I think that's really important. But I think also we need to start with to liberalize the visiting hours. Uh, and it's a really interesting study that was done in Canada. Uh, they extended the visiting hours from four and a half hours to 12 hours. It was a before-after study, so a quality improvement study. And 
they reduced delirium uh, with uh, over 10%, so it halved. So it was before, after study. Uh, I don't think so that will be the effect size that huge, but I think it will help the patients. It's, I think it's really important. And it's not only for the patient, but also well, it's really important for the family, because we know that several relatives, family, will suffer from a post-traumatic stress syndrome afterwards as well. And this may be also helpful to prevent that for the, for the family, to give them a role. Um, a survey that was recently done by Morandi in 47 countries, and almost 60% of the ICUs have implemented uh, the A, A to F bundle, and, and the varying degrees of uh, the compliance was there. So pain assessment was the most frequently used uh, one, that was uh, over 80%. Uh, the spontaneous awakening trial and breathing trial, two-thirds of the patients. Delir monitoring, 70% only, and striking for me uh, was that only in 42% a validated delirium assessment tool was used. So in 60% that was a wrong one used. So striking for me, but also for the patient, of course. Um, early mobilization and family engagement was also um, implemented. And only in one third of the ICUs, there was a 24 seven visiting hours. And I think that's really important to have that. Hopefully we all can go to that one to have 24 seven visiting hours. So uh, a nice study that was recently done by uh, a group of uh, Bounds Daily uh, from California in six uh, hospitals in, Calif in California. And they included 6,000 patients in that. It was a quality improvement study. So there were 6,000 patients and they uh, looked at how the bundle was implemented and how it was used. And what they found that was when in patients with a total bundle compliance, so where all the parts of the bundle was implemented and was used, I, would, I need to say that, was used in those patients, that resulted in a 7% decrease in hospital survival. But when you remove all patients, so exclude all the patients that were admitted only for palliative care, in the ICU, that's not what we normally do in the Netherlands, but in America it's, no, it's not common, but they are also um, admitted uh, in the ICU, those patients. Uh, but if, you exclude, if they excluded those patients that were admitted only for palliative care in the ICU, there was um, an increase of 12% uh, hospital survival in patients that had a total bundle compliance. And also for every 10% increase in bundle compliance, it results in a 2% increase of delirium and coma free days. I think that's very beneficial for the patients. And this is the last study that was done and that just published also this month uh, in critical care medicine. Uh, and this is from Branda Pun from the Vanderbilt University. Uh, and they have included over 50,000 patients in that study. In that study over a period of 20 months. And also the complete bundle compliance was associated with improved outcome. And unfortunately it is, oh, it's working again. Okay, if for ICU discharge, if the bundle was imp used in 30%, 33% of the patients, oh, 33% was used of the bundle compared with zero, it was favorable for around 10% uh, so 10% uh, higher odds that the patient was uh, discharged from the ICU within seven days. And it's going up to over 70% higher chance that the patient was admitted, uh, discharged from the ICU within seven days when the bundle compliance was 100%. And this is for the, oh, no, it's way. Okay, uh, but for that, it's, it's around 40% um, uh, uh, decrease in death, so with a 40% uh, increase in survival uh, when there was a bundle compliance of 60%, and it's going to up to uh, over 70% increase in bundle survival uh, when the bundle compliance was 100%. So for all parts, mechanical ventilation, if you see, for the higher the compliance of the several parts of the bundle, 
the better the outcome. So the lower the duration of mechanical ventilation, less coma days, less delirium, and also less uh, physical restraints that was used. So it seems that significant pain also increased a little bit, but this was not statistically significant. And the author said maybe it could be a result of a better assessment of the patient. So remarks of this, so you have to note uh, for this study that these were all quality improvement studies, but the quality of the studies is not that high. So it's also introducing a lot of bias. So you have to take that into account. And we have to wait for the first randomized control trial for that. And also, no effect was measured on long-term outcomes. So that's a pity. So in conclusion, on time, I think, um, the effects of early rehab in the ICU on post-intense care syndrome is unknown. But I think the use of the ABCF bundle is very promising for short-term uh, outcome for the patient. And I think rehabilitation should be started immediately after the patient is admitted to the ICU. Thank you very much. <laughs>